Welcome everyone. My name is Esther Lee, president of Chinese American Heritage Foundation. We are excited to have Nancy Yao, the president of the Museum of Chinese in America, MOCA, in New York City to share with us about the museum. MOCA aims to engage audience in an ongoing and historical dialogue in which people of all backgrounds are able to see American history through a critical perspective to respect, uh, uh, to reflect on their own experiences and to make meaningful connection between the past and the present, the global and the local themselves and others. Our presenter Nancy Yao has served as the president of MOCA since 2015. Nancy is also a lecturer on governance at the Yale School of Drama. Nancy served on the McGraw-Hill Equality Advisory Committee. Prior to her time at MOCA, Nancy was the executive director of the Yale China Association, one of the oldest nonprofit organization dedicated to building US-China relations. At the Yale China Association, Nancy led more than 20 programs in the area of arts, education, and health. These programs were lauded as best in class and models for bilateral engagement. Before Yale China, Nancy gained over 20 years of leadership experience at nonprofit organization and for profit management, including staff and board position at the Community Fund for Women and Girls, International Festival of Arts and Ideas, Council on Foreign Relations, Goldman Sachs and Company, CNN, and Center for Finance and Research Analyst. This evening, Nancy has also invited two colleagues to join her to do the virtual tour. Nell Wu Gibbs, MOCA's director of the programs, and Julian Bell, MOCA's IT manager. Just a reminder, if you have any question during and after the presentation, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat box. Thank you very much. And without further ado, let's welcome Nancy Yao. Great. Thank you so much, Esther. And I know we're a small group, but as we, as we always say at the museum, small but mighty. And we know that every single person who hears a story about Chinese immigration to America can make a significant difference in broadening the American narrative. Um, so what we'll do tonight, because we are a small group, I'll speak very personally and directly to each and every one of you. And I recognize some names, so thank you for joining us on a Thursday. You can do a lot of different things, including watch Netflix. So pretend I'm not Netflix, but I'm giving this to you from the museum, and I'm really excited to share with you. Um, so my name's Nancy, and I really have the privilege of serving as the president of this museum. So let me bring you through the museum. So often we have visitors come through the door. They come through and they're very excited about being here, but often their excitement quickly wanes. Oh, welcome to the Museum of Chinese in America. And they look around and they seem slightly confused. Is this the Museum of Chinese in America? Yes, it is, welcome, come in but they seem disappointed at first sight. Do you have Chinese art here? I really like those porcelain bowls. Or do you have those Chinese calligraphy? Or is there contemporary ink paintings here at the Museum of Chinese in America? And we have to respond and say no. In fact, if you're looking for traditional Chinese art, or if you're looking for contemporary Chinese art, you can go back down Canal Street and hop on the six train and go north to East 86th Street. And then walk a couple blocks west and you'll find the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They have an incredible section on Asian art. But this museum, the Museum of Chinese in America, you see, we're a US history museum. You're a US history museum? I don't understand. This is a museum of Chinese in America. How can you be a US history museum? And that's exactly what we say. Come in and we'll tell you why we're a US history museum. You see, the Museum of Chinese in America does not have the word Chinese in its mission. In fact, what we're hoping for is that after we walk through this museum and I share a little bit about the Chinese immigration history with each and every one of you, you'll have maybe some stories about Chinese Americans 
but more importantly, you will have a greater sense of yourself as an American. What our goal is, is to broaden the American narrative, to be more inclusive. And our job is to make it more inclusive, to widen it, to allow for more stories and more histories so that we can actually perhaps realize the great beauty of what this country was set up to do, to really be a diverse and truly inclusive country. Come with me and I'll tell you a little bit more about how we try to do that. So this is a core presentation. It's called With a Single Step. And we talk a little bit about the history of Chinese immigration. So you must wonder, this isn't like we can get on a Cathay Pacific flight or Singapore Airlines and you know be in Asia in 12 or 13 hours, no. 250 years ago, the push factors that pushed people out of China and the pull factors that attracted them to America were quite defined. In fact, why did Chinese leave their country and, and come 10,000 miles away? Well, there are a lot of reasons. There was poverty, lack of opportunity, lack of resources, famine, war. And what attracted them to America? Gold. It is a beautiful country. It is filled with gold. And that's what the West Coast is all about. Zhou Yingshan, Mei Guo, beautiful country. So the Southern Chinese predominantly came and saw the opportunity and they said, let us go to America. It's a several uh, weeks, if not months travel, 10,000 miles by boat, but we can get there and then we will find opportunity and we will find riches there. But they did end up coming to the shores of the west coast of America, this beautiful country. But the gold rush was pretty much over. And the opportunities to find gold, to strike it rich, had really dissipated. But there were other opportunities. Leland Stanford, Central Pacific Railroad. Oh, those Chinese men are very strong, even though they are slight in form. And they can help build the foundation of American expansionism. They can help build the transcontinental railroad. We have 1,700 miles left, 700 miles from the west. We have 1,000 miles from the middle of America. Let us build the remaining parts of the Trans-Pacific Railroad. And that's what they did. So many of those Chinese men, they were hired. They were hired to be a part of the railroad building. And they started on the West Coast and the Irish Americans and Native Americans and many Mormons started from the middle of America. And the Chinese, they worked hard. They went through the Sierra Nevada mountains. They ran in placing dynamite, trying to carve their way through the mountains. And they would rush out, hoping that their lives could be spared. And the more successful they were going into the Nevada mountains, the riskier that job was. May 4th, 1859, success. The last spike goes into the railroad. We have completed the 1,700 miles of track. Now, truly, American expansionism can begin. But look carefully. This wonderful celebratory moment, Leland Stanford, Champagne, men celebrating. And yet we know, many of us know on this call, that not one Chinese American is captured in this photograph. We also know at the Museum of Chinese and American, as PBS series has recently also shed light on, over 100,000 pounds of remains, mostly of Chinese men, were sent back to China. They had died in the building of this foundation of American expansionism. They had frozen in the Sierra Nevada mountains in the bitter, bitter cold and winters. But the Chinese were still very proud. They said, we have helped this beautiful country. We have helped to establish this, this beautiful country to be stronger and to be richer. Let us now continue to, to create a life here. Their hopes, unfortunately, were quickly ended. They become a threat, a story that we see often in US history. They were too good at what they did. They were too arduous. They were too hardworking. Anti-Chinese mass meeting, come out tonight. There is a meeting, those Chinese, they are taking our jobs. Huh, what, Chinese? No, 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 no more Chinese here. They are taking all of our jobs. We will not have livelihoods. We hear this over and over again, these stories. 
and quickly the culmination of the anti-Chinese sentiment after they had helped build American Expansionism's foundation. Legislation against the Chinese in America are listed on this wall from top to bottom. Of course, the most well-known, but not well-known enough, was 1882. Less than 30 years after the, ex the completion of the railroad, Congress passes the Chinese Exclusion Act, suspending, ending the immigration of Chinese laborers to the United States. It is the first and only U.S. restriction on immigration based on race and nationality. Now, it's hard for us to think about this, but many people say, oh, no, the Chinese couldn't come to America. How terrible. But that's not what's so terrible. If you are living in a country that says no more of you, it is a discrimination that that group of people feel every single moment of their lives in that country, that beautiful country. So... Many people are very curious. Well, what did they do if they were excluded? And, and how did they have a life? How did they create? There were no jobs. There was discrimination, racism in every place. And these Southern Chinese, mostly from Guangzhou and Toisan and other villages in Southern China, they were resourceful. We still need to make a life. We need to create some semblance of life. What can we do? Well, there are two professions they pursued, hand laundry, Many of you know that these were quite common all across the West Coast and toward the East Coast, as many Chinese men and some women looked for livelihood. This was such a common profession, the Chinese laundromat and the hand laundry, that this iron weighs eight pounds. And it was well known that this was called in Chinese the eight-pound livelihood, a well-known profession. Oh, you are part of the eight-pound livelihood, also known as Chinese laundry. So you can imagine four young children sitting in the back of the room, doing their studies, working with their parents, six people living behind the hand laundry in one room, living, working, studying, making a life. And what's fascinating to me is as the museum takes down hundreds and hundreds of oral histories, we know so many of these hand laundry families, and we have so many objects from their experiences. One person in particular, William Louis, a very renowned architect in his 70s today, he said, Nancy, during my time with my family in the back of the hand laundry, we had very little. We had one room we did everything in, but we had a beautiful life. We, we made something out of nothing. We, we enjoyed each other. We appreciated the life that we had. I always think about that story because I think about how enterprising and how resourceful the Chinese immigrants were despite the massive immigration and discrimination and the racism placed on these people. Again, we're still not seeing any Chinese come in, just the racism in this place. Hollywood did not do any justice to this situation. In fact, they, they completely created the yellow face notation. They created the Fu Manchu. They even had this makeup book right here alongside old darky servant, how to do the makeup of a dark servant, how to draw the face of a Chinaman. As white face actors put on both black and Chinese Asian faces and portrayed them in negative lights. And also, I remember when Nancy Kwan, the famous actress now in her 70s, played a prostitute in the world of Susie Wong, the Asian fetishization of women and she said, I was trained as a ballet dancer, but there were no roles in Hollywood. And I played this role because I wanted to make it the best role I could do. But there's so much popular fiction, popular movies that perpetuated this sense of the, the, the fetishization of Asian women, uh, the Fu Manchu and evilness of the master er Aram of evil, of horror of Chinese American men. But still, the Chinese Americans try to be resourceful. In fact, many people think the other profession that Chinese Americans actually grabbed onto beyond hand laundry was restaurant work. So the two professions that were least desirable was hand laundry and restaurant work. But networks of Chinese Americans came into those professions and they were resourceful and again, quite enterprising. Mugu Gai Pan, delicious Chinese fare. 
and so many other dishes I have never heard of. Now you see, they realize that the Western palate might not appreciate the spices and the hotness of some of the Chinese cuisine. So they created Western cuisines, softer on the palate. And the fortune cookie, now where was that created? As many of us know on this call, in Los Angeles. But we consider those aspects of adjusting and making a life for themselves in a country that discriminated against them. Other ways that they created this life was through associations. Uh, many people know in San Francisco, in New York, in other major cities in, in the United States, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, also known as CCBA, they were really the mothership of many family associations. In fact, in New York City, we still have 66 family associations under the CCBA. And I respectfully call the head of the CCBA the mayor of Chinatown. Now, family associations and other associations are really there to create some semblance of life. They would gather, they would have activities, they were creating social services, they were trying to get together again to create some semblance of life. Many associations formed all over the country, whether in Portland, Oregon, Boise, Idaho, all over the country again, to create some livelihood. Because during the Chinese Exclusion Act, not only were you discriminated against and excluded, but also your citizenships were revoked. You're, they were taken away. Now, there are all kinds of opportunities, if you will, to, to gain your citizenship back or to get your paper names, um, your real name replacing your paper names. If you served in the military, if you worked in government, there were opportunities to do that. But many people didn't have that opportunity and they lived in this anonymity. These stores, these general stores uh, were ubiquitous in major urban areas all across America, as we know. In fact, as, as late as the 1970s and a few exist yet today, these were the general stores. <laughs> this is where you can buy these herbs. I can get them for you in three or four weeks. If you need something, I can find it for you. Oh, would you like to send money back to Toysan? You can give me the money. I will send you a letter. I come back and we can find a return. Um, but you can rent a mailbox here. Oh, it is very bad in this country. You probably cannot find a wife. Many people don't want to marry a Chinese man in this country. In fact, in 1930s in Chinatown, New York City, there were about 4,000 Chinese men living here, about 35 Chinese women, about 4,000 Chinese men living in Chinatown, New York in the 1930s, about 35 Chinese women. Scott Seligman writes about this in his book, uh, Tongue Wars. So, so what is it when you do, like, who's going to marry a man who's excluded? Your citizenship hasn't stripped. What do you do? You write home. You write home, you send money home. You don't want your family to worry. Dear auntie, everything is beautiful in this beautiful country, Meiguo. Here is some money. We're making and doing so well here. Tell everyone I said hello. Men live together in tenement spaces, often called bachelor societies, because they never married. The undesirables, if you will. 10, 12 men living in Chinatowns across America, working 12 hours, 13 hours, writing letters home, sending money home. And they would hang out in front of these general stores on their breaks, sometimes in white t-shirts, as many of us recall, just blowing the breeze, creating a life for themselves. What's fascinating is time passes and we have met the recipients of those letters. They were very young in the 60s and 70s in Toysan. Of course, China opened up. And in fact, I had just recently had a, had a wonderful young woman from Toysan say, oh, we had an uncle in Chinatown, New York. He would send money home to us. And when China was so poor, we were the richest family in our village. We had an uncle in Chinatown. But it wasn't that easy. Uh, the men lived these lives and often they were not accurate portrayals of their actual life. 
but we have those stories, but they often lived in anonymity and families lived in anonymity. Some would go back to Guangzhou or Southern China to find a wife, and some are quite successful at doing that. And others live their life as bachelors. But they also live throughout that life quite in difficult ways. Now, you see, for some reason, my face is considered foreign, so often considered perpetually foreign, as the phrase is. And now, for some reason, also, we see that during the World War II period, now, Japan, now they are the enemy, you see? World War II, Japan is the enemy. But China, now, China is the ally. They are a friend. And don't mistake in the Chinese in this country for the Japanese. And let us give you a cheat sheet, 1942 Life magazine. How to tell the Japanese from the Chinese. Now, you see, the, the, the Chinese, they have a slightly yellower complexion. Uh, but the Japanese, now their cheeks sometimes are a bit rosier. <laughs> Amazing characterization features to help the Chinese not be mistaken for the Japanese, 1942. Life magazine. But as we know, the Chinese is your friend. Now, see, he fights for freedom. He is an ally in World War II. The Japanese Americans interned during World War II, suspected of being a spy. But you can't trust that too much, can you? Because what happens, the flip flopping, depending on the US China, the US Japan bilateral relationship, suddenly your friend or foe your ally or enemy. What happens in 1949? Communism. The PRC government takes hold of mainland China. The Republic of China escapes to Taiwan. Suddenly, China is your enemy. China, communism, McCarthyism. Are you a spy? Are you? Are you a spy? What? You, you, you said I was your friend just a few years ago. You're a spy. You must be a spy. You must be a communist. You're Chinese. Again, the inability in this country to separate the US-China relationship with the Chinese-American. And as we reaffirm over and over again in instances, this constant, constant sense of perpetual foreignness. <laughs> It's not until 1943, the Hart Seller Act, that the quota from 1882 is slightly lifted. The quota goes to 105 Chinese can enter the country in any given year. But they need to be, have some high skills, typesetting, uh, Chinese language. It's not until 1965, Johnson's Immigration Nationality Act, that the quota is finally lifted in 20,000 can come in from any given country. So as others are fighting for civil rights during the 60s period, Chinese Americans and other Asian Americans are fighting for citizenship rights. We have served our country, America. We have lived a good life here. We are American. Please give us our citizenship back. 1965, the US opens the greatest flood of individuals coming in from all different parts of the country. But of course, we all know on this call that China is still closed. It's still under communist rule and closed off to the world. But then where are the Chinese coming from? Now in Chinatowns all across the country, we had the Southern Chinese who had helped build the railroads and their descendants. But now 1965 opens up and we're seeing the diaspora. The Chinese diaspora who had gone to, to Lima, Peru, and Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Montreal, Canada, and, and all parts trying to get in to reconnect with their families who had come here earlier in America. Suddenly, the U.S. has opened, and they're speaking all different dialects. And they're coming in, oh, I speak, I speak Cantonese, I'll go to Chinatown. Oh, I don't understand Cantonese, let me go to Flushing. Let me start up a Monterey Park. Let me go to Alhambra. Let me go to the suburbs of Houston. They go to all of these different areas and build up these new enclaves of Chinese Americans. But the layeredness that happens on top of each one of these immigration waves, whether it's in the 19th century, the early 20th century, after 1943, when elite Chinese were coming in as scholars, or after 1965, when the diaspora was coming in, or whether from Taiwan or from Hong Kong, we're layering the nuances 
the diversity of just this one group of people. <clears throat> and what we often say is, <clears throat> in this country, we often want to see that the Chinese face is one, one type, one monolith. But I'd like to suggest to everyone on the call, as many of you understand this to be, we could not be more diverse a group in this country. The Chinese Americans come from different political regimes. They come from different geographies. They come from different socioeconomic classes. They come from different educational levels. They are so diverse. They can't even communicate with one each other in the same language necessarily, with the dialects and the differences. And yet, the heaviness of that perception that there is just one Chinese in this country further complicates and creates that tension within this very diverse population. And we see that in the suburbs that formed all over, all these different enclaves in Monterey Park and Sunset Park and Flushing, 35 different communities just in the tri-state area of Chinese Americans and Asian Americans living under this perpetual foreignness, under the model minority myth, under this Chinese monolith of one identity. The struggle continues. But what we'd like to suggest is all of this that I've just shared with you, it's probably told you hopefully just one thing, that the infrastructure of this country continues to be burdened with our biases and assumptions, and that the discrimination and exclusion of Chinese in this country is no different than the 400 years of brokenness and oppression of Blacks and African Americans in this country, of, of Sikhs being discriminated against after 9-11, that infrastructure and inability for people in America to understand that this narrative is broader, is wider, and can be so much richer and better than what we have today. So my greatest hope is that what I've shared with you, and many of you know so many more of these details, but that we hope that there can be an opportunity for us to bridge that connection, that in every one of our stories, we can share it with others so that we can meet them where they are when they come through the door and that we can still welcome them in and tell them the story so that they can have a greater sense of themselves. So thank you so much for bringing, walking with me through this museum. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Julian. His arm is probably weak. <laughs> Esther, I can I can field any questions if you like. Yeah, so um, I I missed the year that when you were showing the article, um, saying that they want to look at the different compare different face of the Japanese and Chinese. What year was that? Nineteen forty-two during World War Two. Life magazine. Forty-two. I mean, it just bring back the history of Vincent Chin. I mean, I'm like remember like he was miss. Miss uh, took as a Japanese. I guess that article didn't help that um, yeah. they thought he was constant. Japanese. So I was just wondering, you know, what's the year difference? So it was like at least like 40 years difference. Right. I think that's exactly right, Esther. And I think the, the overall theme that we've noticed is depending on the, the U.S. bilateral relationship with any given country, the assumptions are that the people living here have some sort of association with what's happening on the bilateral. Um, and there is a difficulty, especially with an Asian face, to separate that. Like, you don't hear about Irish Americans um, facing discrimination because of U.S.-Ireland relations. That's a, that, that doesn't, you don't hear that very often. But every time the U.S.-China relationship is fraught, and we bring this up particularly now because the, the current ambassador and many other China experts have said over and over again the last several months that the U.S.-China relationship is at its most fraught ever. And, and that really concerns me because I have, we have seen the history here that if US-China bilateral relations are very weak or tense, that there is potentially um, some sort of ramification on Chinese Americans. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, just now while you were doing the presentation, I saw that people like um, in the museum, what, what's your hours? Oh yeah, uh, we're open. My appointment all the time, but today's Thursday, so we keep it open till nine o'clock. And we're free because we realize that during this COVID-19 period, there's a lot of people who need space to heal and to, 
to have access points and to, to just experience some of the content here and to better understand um, the journey. So we've actually waived all admissions so that people can come in and, and access the museum. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah, wow. so come by. And we <laughs> also have a current exhibit, yeah. Yeah, so do you um, often have new exhibit or uh, not necessarily? Oh no, we 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 do, um, and and you know I want to you know really just um, I'm excited to share that our small team. You know, you've met Julian and Neil, but of course Herb Tam and Andrew Rabat and Kevin Chu, the curatorial team, our education team, our collections team. We were picked as one of twenty of America's cultural treasures by the Ford Foundation and a consortium they formed. So that was a really big um, accolade for us that we our our voice and the museum's voice needs to be amplified. Um, and on top of that, Mackenzie Scott um, also said that the, the content in the museum should be amplified. So what we're really trying to do is make it accessible to all. So we're on different platforms. So Bloomberg Connects um, has a wonderful platform. Uh, Google Arts and Culture has a platform. So you can get a lot of our um, exhibits online. Um, and also what we really are proud of is that we have a very formal structure. Um, it takes about two years, 18 months to two years to do the research and do the due diligence um, and the procurement and to create every current exhibit. Um, and the, the curatorial team led by Herb Tam is just top notch. Um, and I really, you know, I applaud them all the time for being, I think, you know, some of the best curators in this country. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's see. Mm. Oh, that is just, I uh, have a one comment and say, there's a link. This one is from US Army, not Life Magazine, but um, somebody was sharing a link about the question, I guess I asked about Japanese and yeah. Chinese. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Nancy, you know what? Um, you, that was an amazing, awesome presentation. And oh, your enthusiasm you. really inspired me. I have been oh. to um, your museum one time, but with you, just your short presentation, I already felt that I missed some of the history that I, I didn't, you know, looked at, especially just now that, that magazine, I didn't even remember seeing that. So I would love to come in person again to um, look at um, all the history that I missed. So I hope that, you know, all the attendees, you know, will come to visit your museum as well. And this is yeah. being recorded. Yeah, and um, definitely want to put it on our website. And because this is May, um, the API month, that's a lot of webinar going on. So a lot of people also email me and ask me, will this be recorded? They want to watch it a little bit later. So uh, we're definitely going to share with um, everybody. Great. Yeah, thank you. And and also, if you come to the museum, we have a Chinatown map. Um, so support the local economy. We also have a walking path um, because what's wonderful about being on the corner of Chinatown is you can actually still experience the changing neighborhood um, and the new efforts and the artwork that's a part of this this thriving um, and very passionate um, community. And, and that map will help you navigate. We get a lot of questions from people who visit, like they don't know how to navigate Chinatown or they're intimidated because they think they need to speak Chinese. And obviously you don't, but we just wanna make it a little bit easier and to explain some of the things you might see that are maybe traditional culture, but also you know modern contemporary culture. Um, hey, like Nancy, the dancing we, we, in the parks. Yeah, yeah, Nancy, we still have a few few minutes left. Do you want to talk just a little bit about the new building? Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I would, I love would to. like to yeah, hear a little bit about, uh, I know you're going to have another webinar about it, but uh, since we have a few minutes, can you share a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, so MOC has been around for 42 years. It was co-founded by Jack Chen and Charlie Lai. Uh, Jack Chen is a, um, a researcher, PhD, and Charlie Lai is a community, um, community public servant. And it, we've been working on the permanence of a, of a home for that entirety of time. So as many of you know, it's really hard to, um, museums, I ask you this question, I ask a lot of people, how much do you want to pay when you go to a museum? And the answer is typically zero. Um, it, you think it's a public good, it's a public you know, space, and it should be free. But obviously, as a nonprofit, it 
takes a lot to run um, and curate and educate. Um, and there are a lot of expenses. So MOCA has been actually renting space here for 15 years. And we have an operating budget of just under $3 million. So it's a lot to do with a very little um, you know, shoestring budget. We always knew that we wanted to find a permanent home. Um, I've been here for almost, for seven and a half years. And my mandate was always to help find a permanent home so we could reduce the expenses around the, um, around the operating lines. And this is you know, a little bit more financial, but I think it's important to understand and MOCA was fortunate enough to receive an unprecedented um, cumulative grant over six years of $40.3 million from the Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, so the DCLA in New York City is the funding arm for all of the arts and cultural museums across the city. Um, and it's really interesting because it's unprecedented for a Asian American anything uh, to receive this type of funding, but it took a long time and it's specifically for capital. What that means is you actually have to purchase a home. So you have to purchase an asset. So the funds are very distinctly um, positioned for the seller and doesn't go into like our piggy bank or anything. It goes directly to the seller to find the permanent home because the city is trying to stabilize a lot of these arts and culturals. What's fascinating to me is that this type of funding is unprecedented and because it's unprecedented, people are very confused by, um, oh, why did they get it? Why didn't someone else get it? And I think what we're trying to really do is help educate that this is unprecedented, but it's a very good thing. And when you do something unprecedented, it'll hopefully open the door for other opportunities if we can steward those funds properly. So fast forward, Maya Lin, the amazing artist and architect, actually donated her design services and redesigned this entire new MOCA. And we will ribbon cut on this new museum space in 2025, which really feels like very, very soon to us. And from that day, working backwards, um, every single day, there's a deadline on things that we need to do. We're working with 400 scholars across the country about the Chinese American narrative and the history and the nuances. And I hope that even the experts on this call, I know many of you know a lot of this history, that when you come to the new MOCA, 95% of the experience will be new and different. I think what's happened in some of this narrative and research work is that because there's not enough research done in this space in American studies as it pertains to the Chinese American immigration story, that there's a lot of anecdotal stories that gets repeated quite often. And it becomes slightly subjective, it becomes slightly anecdotal, but we need to create and instill and catalyze a greater research arm. So the new MOCA will have three incredible new components, a center for research and genealogy, so even if you don't speak Chinese, you'll be able to look up your surname and understand potentially your family roots. It will have a 199 seat performance theater so that we can give you inspiration to create new works. And we hope that theater is used every single day for rehearsals, for jam sessions, for, for poetry slams, for whatever might be, and that there is voice and performance around all this content. And then the other thing is, it's just gonna be a beautiful space that people can experience um, the, the, the more defined, more nuanced um, understanding of, of, of what we've been sharing today and just, we're just really skimming the surface on today. But we know that the, that the new narrative has to be much richer and much more diverse and we're excited, but it's, it's a heavy lift because it's unprecedented. And the entire campaign, just so folks know the numbers, is $128 million, again, unprecedented. I mentioned earlier, our operating budget is only $2.8 million. So we're going from a baby organization to trying to raise $128 million, completely unprecedented. And, and frankly, there's a lot of you know, growing sense of what philanthropy looks and feels like in, in, this, in this Chinese American community and Asian American community. And it's tricky. It's really, really tricky. Um, so we're, we're, we're being steadfast about it. You know, we're taking one step every day and we're excited about the potential. And, and I guess the last thing I'll say about the new MOCA is, have every confidence that when we create this new museum, the new museum of Chinese in America, it will make a difference. It will make a difference because it's education. And before our textbooks can be rewritten, which may take 10 or 15 years, we need museums like MOCA and Museo de Barrio and Holocaust Museum and, 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 and Studio Museum in Harlem. We need them to be the public access points to get that education and that information out to as many people as possible. 
Um, so we anticipate 300,000 visitors will visit the new MOCA. Today, we have about 50,000 a year. Wow. So it's very exciting. exciting. So if anyone very wants exciting. to know more about it, yeah, yeah, let me know. And I'll show you a quick image of it. Okay. Um, so you can see this. This is Maya's wow. design of the exterior. Yeah. So it's beautiful. Amazing. Beautiful. Yeah. And when we do beautiful. the formal one, and this is a gorgeous uh, performance space that we hope will be used regularly. And there are lots of other renderings, but um, it, it'll be a beautiful space. And we hope uh, a real community center. There'll be organizations and residents, artists and residents, commission works, commission performance pieces. And it, it'll be wonderful. And we're really excited about it. But, you know, it's not easy. Um, mm -hmm. It's not easy yeah, because of it's unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, and there's a lot of noise out there and, and we just, we're trying to stay um, on the straight and narrow because I guess birds aren't real and there's a lot of disinformation out there. And I think everyone on our team, the 12, 13 of full-time people and the part-time staff, we know this will make a difference and we're just working as hard as we can to get it done. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, we do have a question. Does the museum yeah. have materials related to the Chinese opera troops that perform in U.S.? Yes. Ah. We have a large collection of the Peking opera uh, costumes. Uh, they were donated to us and they were saved from this terrible fire we had January 23rd, 2020. And we have actually quite substantial. Um, there are a couple of different opera companies that were probably the um, early part of the 20th century. Uh, so yeah, come by. And oh, you can go onto our website. We have three platforms to do research, uh, Past Perfect, Archive Space, and Metadata Oral History Synchronizer. So those are all accessible via our website, mocanyc.org. Um, those are three platforms for research. Um, and then we have also the Bloomberg Connects and the Google Arts and Culture, which is more of a virtual experience of the museum. So take a look there. And you can do really fun search key images, Google images, um, a lot of things will come up. But if you type in opera, a lot of things will come up. Oh, that's great. Okay, yeah. this question is from Nancy. Nancy, does, do you speak Toisanese, Cantonese, or oh Mandarin? <laughs> I wish I speak Toisanese. And one sick dong no hua. One sick ting. But I studied Cantonese for three years. <laughs> but all I can say is moment <laughs> no, I can say other stuff. But, um, but I speak Mandarin and my father's um, Shanghainese and my mother is from born in Sichuan, but I speak Mandarin. Okay. All right. So these were the questions. Um, so, well, thank you again, Nancy, for your precious time. Thank you. Uh, you, you are amazing. You are an amazing lady. Oh, thank you. And Come and visit. Esther, you're you amazing. Are. Esther you and are. I were in a car parade for Lunar New Year in Boston. <laughs> She should know to never have me get in her car parade. <laughs> <laughs> no, you are great. You are great. Yeah. So very the best of luck to Mocha. And we okay. definitely will come to Thank visit. You. Yes. And I uh, can't wait to see the new museum in 2025. Yeah. And make sure to eat and support the local economy when you come down to visit us. Yes, definitely will. Okay. Thanks, okay, everyone. goodbye. Have Thank good you night. so much. Thank you for See all you. the attendees. Thank Have you, a Julian. great night. Goodbye. Muscle Julian. Neil. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Neil. Bye. Thank you, Julian. Okay, bye. bye. Have a good night. Good night. Bye.